Great. Well, um, a warm welcome to everybody who's joining us from all around the world for this webinar. My name's Tim Minchell, and I'm co-chairing this event with Chris Dungey, CTO of the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. So this webinar is being uh, hosted by the UK Manufacturing Forum, uh, which is a, a collaboration between the IFM, the Institute for Manufacturing at the University of Cambridge, and the High Value Manufacturing Catapult. Hence, it has the two chairs today. Uh, I'm just going to give a few very brief introductory words and then hand over to our two excellent speakers to share the results of this wonderful research that they've undertaken. A couple of words of introduction. So what is the UK Manufacturing Forum? Some of you may be asking. So it is this collaboration that brings together the worlds of research and innovation relating to manufacturing. Why? Because we all know that manufacturing is, a, is an integral part of any thriving balanced economy. And if we want manufacturing to be able to contribute to ensure the competitiveness and the productivity of any economy, we need to make sure we're doing that in a way which is resilient, which is sustainable, and which is equitable. And to do that, we need to join up all of the activities around generating new knowledge with ensuring that that new knowledge is delivered most effectively into the manufacturing sector. So that is the UK Manufacturing Forum. And Chris will be telling you a little bit more about a, a next event that's being organized by the forum um, at, at the end of this webinar. Um, right, at this point, I think I'd just like to ask Gwen to change the next slide, please. So here is the agenda for the rest of this hour long session. I'm nearly done with my introduction. And I'll be handing over to Gwen and Jennifer, who will be sharing the results of this great bit of research supported by the Interact project. They'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Then uh, the chair will be handed over to Chris Dungey, who will then guide us through a Q&A session, and I'll, rather strangely, become a panellist rather than co-chair. And then, having had those questions, and please do put your questions into the Q&A uh, function on the webinar, and these will be monitored and picked up as, uh, we'll pick up as many as we can. And then Chris will wrap things up at the end with a summary, a brief summary of what we've talked about, key issues, and then, as I say, highlighting this other event that's happening next month in Sheffield, organised by the UK Manufacturing Forum. But on that note, I think I'd like to hand over now to Gwen and Jennifer, who will share with us the results of this really interesting research. Gwen, over to you. Thank you, team. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We would like to start this presentation by sharing the uh, two minutes video that was just released as part of this project. So hopefully this would work. Manufacturing has undergone a significant transformation from the traditional image of noisy old machines and factories. Today, manufacturers are crafting innovative products, generating groundbreaking ideas, and actively addressing big global challenges like climate change and food security. In recent years, countries like the UK and the US have seen a decline in manufacturing, but the numbers don't always reflect its true importance. Manufacturing is crucial for innovation as it turns new ideas into better, safer and cleaner products using the latest technologies. The sector is a powerhouse for communities and economies and is essential for building strong, resilient societies. For example, during the tough times of COVID-19, manufacturing played a crucial role in keeping things going from face mask production to vaccines. Unfortunately, old stereotypes of monotonous, repetitive manufacturing jobs still exist. But manufacturing offers diverse, exciting, and well-paid jobs. For example, IT and robotics engineers, environmental sustainability managers, machine operators, and design engineers are all examples of skilled roles in manufacturing. So how can we change the perception of manufacturing? If you work in manufacturing, why not become a champion for the sector by sharing your experience with your friends and family? If you're exploring career options, why not consider manufacturing? It's a chance to be at the forefront of innovation, and it's a far more diverse and exciting sector than you might think. If you want to learn more about how modern manufacturers are reshaping our world, visit the Interact website for information and resources. 
Welcome to those that just joined. Uh, this was the fun part of our project. And now uh, Jennifer and I will dig into some of the main instances of the, the report that we have worked on for the past months, how to make manufacturing charming again. Is it everything everywhere all at once? We have collaborated for this project with uh, Dalila Ribaudo from Aston Business School. Um, so just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, this is an Interact funded project. Interact, Interact is a, a program funded by Made Smarter Innovation, and we have been conducting a systematic literature review uh, that will serve uh, for a work that Interact will conduct uh, in the next couple of years on the future of manufacturing work with uh, an international scope. So we review literature from academia and practice. Our idea was really to understand what's the perception of manufacturing, both uh, across the general public and at the policy level, and uh, how um, we wanted to grasp a sense about how manufacturing is discussed in other countries. The structure of the reports and of today's uh, presentation um, will be the following. So I'll guide, through, I'll guide you through um, our discussion about uh, what is manufacturing is uh, by itself a question that probably uh, could, uh, we could spend like the entire hour on this, but I'll try not to. And then I'll take you through the perception from the public. We have a bit of, we have reviewed a bit of insights from both the UK and uh, across different countries. And then I'll hand over to Jennifer and she'll take you to the perception at the policy making level. We specifically review uh, policy documents from seven countries. And uh, we, re we review also um, some of the trends that we call mega trends that are uh, particularly relevant in uh, today's discussion on, on manufacturing. So um, kicking off, what is manufacturing? Um, I think uh, it's a question that we could respond in many different ways. So we could go from the uh, idea of manufacturing from the old style factory uh, floor industrial production of the the first industrial revolution to the future to the futuristic idea of a smart factory with no with no workers. We probably all know in this in this webinar that we are somewhere in between, and the, the reality of manufacturing is in between. And that there is uh, quite I mean the most of the most of the spectrum of companies um, are coping with a complex process of technology adoption and adaptation. So in a certain way, we could say that we are. Um, far in a similar way from from both of these uh, of this picture, but the perception is according to um, the people that you speak to, or like this, this survey conducted in different places or in different country can actually be closer to this picture more than what we thought. Um, a bit more detail here, uh, we wanted to share this uh, this diagram um, because the uh, getting to the core of our work, manufacturing means different things in different parts of the world. Sometimes it means also different things across people in the same country. But here we wanted to give, um, we wanted to shed some light on uh, the fact that in different countries, there are different concepts within the manuf within the concept of manufacturing that can be um, highlighted and emphasized. So it, at its core, I think we could all agree that manufacturing revolves around factor-based production um, activity with many different factors influencing production. So of course we have knowledge, research and development, the uh, organization of production, the transformation of uh, inputs, natural resources, the labor and capital as the two main factors of, of production that are also treated in different way and it's given emphasis in, in different way across different countries. Here we sort of wanted to um, give a sense uh, of what uh, manufacturing, how manufacturing is different across three countries. So you can see in green, the US, in red, the, the Germany, and in orange, uh, pink, orange, the uh, Japan. So in the US, just going briefly through this, uh, an emphasis in the past uh, 10, 15 years has been on product development and specifically the delivery process. So production here uh, um, and in the advanced manufacturing concept they've been using aims to translate knowledge into tangible products and services. So it's very, it's very strong the idea to go from research and development to demonstration to supply chain, to supply chain management. Um, and yeah, so they've been all the, the policy program in the US has been focusing quite a lot in the, adv the advanced manufacturing concept. In Germany, uh, it's different. Um, it's very interwin. The concept of manufacturing is very interwin with the concept of production capability, 
And this is particularly the case of Germany, but also countries that are characterized by higher wages and um, that are characterized as well and as a consequence or a cause of high, high wages uh, by high capital in intensity. And as a third example, different that they use a sort of a different word for manufacturing in Japan, the monozukuri concept, which uh, means the art of making things. So Japan has been focusing quite a lot in the material transformation um, of, uh, of goods. Uh, so it's not by chance that um, a lot of the um, manufacturing, a lot of their manufacturing conception goes around the zero waste and uh, particular focus on the, the way in which labor and production is organized. Um, just giving a zoom in a bit into the UK. Um, so we, I, I just, wa just wanted to show you two graphs that we think are particularly significant. With, with, this, with this report, we also want to debunk some of the myths that um, are going around uh, the world, not only the UK. So for sure, the share of manufacturing value added uh, has been uh, decreasing over time. Here is uh, we, we represent a simple bar graph uh, with the difference of share manufacturing value added over total value added in 1991, the blue bar, and in 2019, the orange bars. You can see that it has decreased across these five countries we we look at. Uh, it has decreased particularly in the UK and in the US, but about the UK, we also wanted to show you this graph with, which measure the um, increase of uh, value added in knowledge intensive services. And as you can see here, I don't know if you can see it's quite small, but from 1991 to, to, to 2019, there has been an increase specifically in certain sector that has been uh, have been studied more in depth in this report that we suggest to download inside the black box of manufacturing, um, um, wrote and developed by two colleagues at IMF, Austin Hodge and Oino Sullivan. And it's interesting that the the high, the high the knowledge intensive studies that have been increased the most are the scientific research and development, the computer programming, consultancy, and the related activity, um, and the professional scientific and technical services. And what is interesting is that uh, we argue that a lot of these high value and services are actually um, very complementary to having a strong manufacturing sector um, in the country. And as you probably all know in this webinar, uh, despite the decrease, manufacturing in the UK economy is still quite important. Here, uh, we just presented a couple of figures from the innovation report uh, from, from 2023, which is the flagship report from Cambridge Industrial Innovation Policy, where both Jennifer and I are based. So in terms of value added, 8.7%. Um, in terms of employment, is still um, quite high. But especially in terms of export and research and development in, in the private sector, you can see like in export almost um, yeah, 50%. So here in the bar graph, we could, you can also see the different con type of contribution of different sectors. And for export and research and development, the most of the contribution is given by the medium high tech manufacturing and the knowledge intensive services, which we argue have quite a bit of complementarities. So jumping into the um, the perception from the gen general public that we review, I just have two slides on the perception in the UK and the perception across um, across the world, actually two other countries that we, we, re we review in depth. It's quite hard to find surveys on the perception of manufacturing across the public. And actually one of our recommendations is in fact to, uh, especially for the UK to um, collect more systematically this data. So the perception in the UK we found is that is not set in stone. It's been changing over time. In 2001, the British public didn't know very little about manufacturing and believed the country could go, could go growth, sorry, could grow without it. In 2012, the um, most of the um, of the people believe that uh, manufacturing the industry is high tech, so they connect the manufacturing to industry and high tech. However, 74 percent believe that manufacturing jobs are the first one subject to offshoring, um, which uh, probably is uh, um, something that was going on quite quite a lot in the news at that time and in the reality. Uh, there is a difference in the uh, age of respondents. So the older respondent uh, does a, that have 55 plus years uh, believe that the UK needs a strong manufacturing sector in 2012, uh, while younger people uh, believe that the UK could grow without it. 
probably among the interesting data also because they are the most recent. In 2023, uh, there were a couple of surveys that we reviewed. One interesting interact survey conducted in uh, England. Um, and they reported that over 80% of the people uh, recognize the key role of manufacturing in UK reputation and supply chain. To me, one of the most um, uh, one of the most surprising uh, figure was this 30% that said that they don't read or see anything about UK manufacturing. If you follow uh, Tim's initial idea that everything is manufacturing around us, um, it's quite surprising that 30% of the people actually uh, don't relate anything with manufacturing that they see or, or read about. Uh, people are generally positive about manufacturing in 2023, but they are skeptical about the job quality. And 60%, for example, believe that the jobs are repetitive and they do not offer high salaries, uh, benefit or enough job flexibility, a concept that also uh, comes um, quite often in this type of, of studies. In another survey from 2023, 93% believe that the industry is essential to growth and resilience. It would be interesting to explore more how much do the, the shocks that have been occurring at the global level uh, have an impact on this. Briefly on two or three other countries that we review. So uh, probably with no surprise in Germany, 55% of respondents in 2018 uh, mentioned that they consider manufacturing very attractive. And Germans among, among the countries that we review are the most inclined to regard manufacturing as a vital component of their economy, 75%. Uh, versus Canada, where there is a much more pronounced and persistent negative image of manufacturing. In the US, the, um, the perception of manufacturing are slightly getting better, but uh, only 35% view manufacturing as offering good job opportunities here. I forgot to put the uh, year, but it must be 2018. And uh, um, generally across the survey that we, we reviewed, the uh, sector uh, was uh, seen as a sector where, where there's little diversity, both in terms of gender and in terms of, uh, of, back, of background. And with the perception from the public, I leave the floor to Jennifer. Thank you, Wayne. Um, good afternoon and thank you for joining us in, in this uh, webinar. One of the points that we want to stress from the, the report is how uh, manufacturing is addressed or not addressed in uh, industrial and innovation policies influences public perceptions. And because of this, uh, we were interested in understanding how policymakers talk about manufacturing. And we did it reviewing 68 strategies and initiatives across these seven countries that when mentioned, and all these are advanced economies where manufacturing plays a, an important role, but we can see differences in manufacturing trends across these countries and also differences in policy approaches. Most of the, uh, in general, what we saw is that there is a revival or a return of industrial policy. However, uh, more often than not, they don't use the, the term industrial policy. In general, we find more industrial strategies or innovation strategies where they talk about um, manufacturing. Next, please, Wen. Thank you. Uh, as Wen mentioned, we can see different approaches across different countries on how they refer to manufacturing. But in general, we saw that there is an increased use of terms such as advanced manufacturing and related terms such as low carbon manufacturing, advanced materials, sustainable manufacturing, net zero manufacturing, where they are trying to highlight the, the role that high tech has in manufacturing, but also how manufacturing can help to solve societal challenges such as the, the net zero targets. For example, the five-year strategic plan of next generation manufacturing Canada makes this distinction between manufacturing and advanced manufacturing. It says, if manufacturing is the business of making things, then advanced manufacturing involves the use of leading edge technologies. So they may make this distinction about how advanced manufacturing is really uh, driven by, by high-tech technologies. Um, next, please, Wen. Uh, what we saw in the different national strategies is that they portray the role of manufacturing as, as crucial for the economy and society 
They explain how manufacturing is a key driver of economic growth, exports, productivity, research and innovation, and regional development and social inclusion. For example, in Singapore, we saw how the Singapore Minister of uh, Trade and Industry referred to manufacturing as the bedrock of Singapore's economy. In the US and Switzerland, we found that there is an emphasis on how manufacturing has, plays a crucial role in translating uh, research into profits or in the role of uh, innovation. In the US, we also found how they acknowledge how the decline of manufacturing across the different uh, states uh, within the US has led to an increase in inequality. Next, please. And because different countries has, are recognizing the role of manufacturing within their economies, we also observe how many of them are setting targets to increase the participation of manufacturing within their economies. One of the most common metrics is value added shares. And in this term, they usually have this metric that uh, to achieve or to sustain uh, shares, value added shares of manufacturing around 20 and 30%. Next, please, Wen. Uh, across these different initiatives, as uh, Wen mentioned, we observe how one of the, or some of the main priorities are climate change and environmental sustainability, digitalization, but increasingly there are other challenges that these uh, strategies are trying to address. Some of them are um, skills gaps or skill shortages, how population uh, are aging, but also uh, the impacts of COVID-19 and geopolitical tensions meant that they are increasingly emphasizing the role of manufacturing in resilience, national security, the reconfiguration of value chains, and also uh, on technology uh, sovereignty. And this is related with the perceptions that when was mentioned uh, mentioning before on how people are also perceiving the role of manufacturing in these issues. Next, please, Gwen. Thank you. Uh, in terms of sectors, we see that strategies tend to prioritize food and beverages, that this sector is uh, really close linked to food security, for example, but they also prioritize other sectors such as automotive, pharmaceuticals and related uh, industries such as biomanufacturing, biotechnology, and other sectors that they prioritize are microelectronics, machinery and equipment, and increasing, increasingly also defense. Next, please, uh, when We saw that these changes in priorities and the ongoing focus on digitalization and environmental sustainability have changed how manufacturing is described, is described and how they emphasize, as I mentioned before, its high tech nature and also the, the role of manufacturing in solving societal channels, challenges. Um, this transformation have also uh, broadened the scope of activities and the value chain segments that are discussed within manufacturing. They increasingly link uh, how manufacturing and services are connected, and they are also including within the manufacturing value chain activities such as design and recycling. Next, please, when uh, just to uh, yeah, present some examples. For example, in, in Germany's Digital Strategy 2025, uh, they make this distinction or they made this point of, of how the distinction between manufacturing and services will become less important. And in the US, they make a similar point and they emphasize how manufacturing shouldn't be seen just as a sector, but they uh, this sector should be, be uh, considered as part of the, the separate, uh, sorry, about it should be uh, seen as part of this value chain that includes activities such as R&D, product design, software development, etc. Next, please, Wen. Uh, as I mentioned before, skill shortages are one of the challenges that are being addressed within these uh, national strategies and initiatives that we reviewed. Um, in terms of this area, they are increasingly uh, interested in looking at teams such as the, the skilling of, of workers related with the automation of tasks, uh, how increasing diversity and inclusion is needed in the sector, the aging of the population and the related uh, shortages in terms of, of skills. But what is was also quite interesting to see uh, 
is that, for example, in the case of Germany and Korea, they are also talking about the mismatch between the demand and supply of skills and how this mismatch uh, is a risk that uh, can create like some uh, employees may be left behind. In the case of Germany, we also observe how they not only talk about skill shortages, but they also talk about the shortages of uh, further training specialists. Next, please, uh, Wayne. Thank you. Uh, in the report, we also address a gender dimension. Uh, next, please. When I think there is some text, thank you. Um, and as Wen mentioned before, in general, there is a perception that manufacturing uh, is a male dominated sector, and this discourages women to participate in the sector. However, this perception is actually confirmed by the statistics. For example, in the UK, 26% of women uh, participate in these sectors. And if we, we look at the figures for high-tech uh, manufacturing sectors, such as automotive and aerospace, these figures are even lower. Uh, this trend, as you can see in the table, is very similar across the, the countries that we analyze. Next, please, uh, Wen. Despite this clear on the representation of women, gender inequalities are rarely addressed in, in industrial and innovation strategies. Um, next, please, one. Thank you. Um, of the 68 strategies and initiatives that we examine, only 15 address gender inequalities, and all of them have a very narrow scope. And what do we mean uh, here by narrow scope? In general, what we found is that whenever these strategies address gender disparities is like a very short mention, and usually these are very isolated issues. For example, in one strategy, they will talk about gender disparities in access to finance. In, in another one, they will talk about patent activity. But in none of these, uh, we saw a systematic approach in analyzing gender disparities or addressing these, these disparities. We also analyzed how they were using uh, images within these uh, strategies. In general, we found that there is uh, uh, overall a gender balance in, in the use of images or that they use gender neutral images. Uh, we only observed two exceptions. In the, in the case of Germany, we only found one strategy, the German Digital Strategy 2025, where they use predominantly more uh, many images. And in the case of Canada, it was actually the, the other way around. We found two strategies and one initiative where they were using more women images. Next, please, Wen. So some key uh, takeaway messages that we have from this report. As um, Wen mentioned before, one of the, of the key messages or the key learnings from doing this report was that we need that systematic collection of data, such as the great efforts that interact has done with the perceptions of manufacturing survey uh, need to be continuing in the future, maybe every year or every two years, but we really need to, to continue monitoring how these perceptions evolve in the future and how the digital and green transformation also are shaping these, these perceptions. Um, another key message that we got from the report and also from the Interact survey is that younger demographics are more attracted to more diverse environments. And if we want to increase diversity, uh, a, well, a well way to do it is setting measurable targets. For example, in the case of Germany, uh, in the future research and innovation strategy, they have set a target for increasing the proportion of women in professorships from 27% in 2021 to 30% by 2025. And lastly, is to emphasize how important it is to provide education and career information about manufacturing from early education stages, but also to, to parents. And I'm just going to, to conclude our presentation with two examples, one from Canada and one from the US, where they are trying to attract uh, younger generations to the sector, and also they are trying to change the perceptions of manufacturing. For example, in, in Canada, in, in the Careers of the Future in, uh, program, this program is led by Next Generation Manufacturing, NGEN. And this is a non-for-profit organization that is uh, committed to in 
develop the capabilities in terms of advanced manufacturing in Canada. The initiative is supported by funding from the government, but also by members of the engine uh, network. Some of the activities that they include in this program uh, are, for example, the Your Future Career. This is a quite interesting initiative. What they have is in their website, they have information about the different technologies that they use in, in advanced manufacturing, but also the different streams that people can follow uh, in manufacturing careers. For example, they have streams related with science, streams related with engineering, streams related with business, with the skilled trades. Another initiative part of this program is Meet the Change Makers. And this, uh, this uh, series portrayed uh, or yeah, future different uh, interviews with young people that are working in the manufacturing sector. So this uh, second initiative is more about increasing visibility of role models, but in particular focusing on young people. And the last one, the manufacturing the future context is the, uh, sorry, well, yeah, thank you. Um, the manufacturing the future context is an essay contest that is focused for uh, teenagers between, seven, uh, between 15 and 18 years old. And the aim of this context, they encourage these uh, young people to describe why they are interested in manufacturing and how manufacturing can help to solve the problems of the future. Next, please, when And uh, the last example from the US. Uh, in the US, we saw how Manufacturing USA uh, Network, this is a network of institutes working in different areas within manufacturing and uh, innovation. And we saw that they have different initiatives trying to improve the perception of manufacturing, but also trying to increase the diversity within this sector. So one example of these initiatives is the Manufacturing Day, that is a, an initiative very similar to the one that Make UK has here in the UK. Uh, another example is the Women Make Awards. Uh, in this initiative, they try to increase the visibility of female role models. They recognize uh, the efforts and the work of different women working in manufacturing. But what is also quite interesting of this initiative is that they encourage these uh, outstanding women to mentor new generations and to encourage new, uh, new generations to participate in manufacturing. Uh, the next initiative, Modern Makers, is very similar. Is, uh, trying to be, uh, increase the visibility of role models within manufacturing and they feature men and women across different stages in their careers. And this covers from people working in the manufacturing USA institutes, but also in companies. And finally, the Pathways to Manufacturing Careers is a very interesting initiative that they have information across the websites of the different Manufacturing USA Institute. They have information about the different jobs that are available in, in manufacturing, uh, how many vacancies they have across the different roles, the type of skills that they need, the type of salaries that they usually earn, and also training course that can help people to develop this, the skills that are needed for these jobs. And, and with this, uh, I will conclude and just encourage people that join this, this webinar, if they want to continue the, this dialogue and continue learning about this, uh, please follow the Interact uh, Network channels. They have very interesting information and the on the 21st of March, they will have a workshop on perceptions of manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you very much, Gwen, as well. Very comprehensive uh, material that you've produced there in terms of the report, and obviously you've synthesised that into several or many key findings there. So thank you very much for, for doing that. So we're now going on to the, the panel Q&A session. So I could warmly welcome Gwen and Jennifer back to the panel, as it were. And Tim, please, could you also join us in the panel? I don't know. In a normal stand-up situation, we'll be reconfiguring here, take a few minutes, but clearly we're not, not doing that. So in terms of uh, this next part of the session, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes in terms of a bit of a panel Q&A. So what I'd like to do is just open it up, particularly just to stimulate the audience that are involved today. Is there any further questions you'd like to ask? Clearly now's the time to get onto the Q&A chat function and type away furiously, as it were, to get those questions coming in thick and fast. We've had a few now that have arrived. So what I'll do is I'll open up with a few 
uh, questions then. So Tim, I'd like to pose one to yourself, if that's OK. You, you've had a bit of time to rest. I'll, I'll give Gwen and uh, Jennifer a few minutes uh, rest before I go to yourselves, as it were. But Tim, how do you think the UK ecosystem is responding to the need for different skills in manufacturing? And just a bit of context to some of these, who are the critical actors to make sure that manufacturing will find the skills they need? And also, how, how much do you think actors such as the catapults could provide activities to fill these gaps? So please, Tim, over to you. That's great, Chris. Thank you very much. And can I just um, echo your uh, thanks to uh, Gwen and Jennifer? I thought that was a great presentation. This is this is such an important and timely topic and really, really nice to see that that UK and international focus. There. And so many interesting findings coming out from it. But uh, I must now. Yes, Chris, your a great question. I guess the. Uh, and I'd be interested to hear Gwen and Jennifer's uh, thoughts on this as well, if I, I get this wrong. But there's something about the skills for manufacturing can be divided into many into many different ways. And I guess there's something about existing technology, so stuff that's already there, and we know how to do it, and it's a mature technology, a mature process. Are we making sure the UK uh, ecosystem is supporting the development of skills in areas that are very refined, very mature technology. So for example, I guess, um, industrial digitalization. Yes, it's still evolving, but there's a lot of techniques that have been out there for a while. Are those, the people with the skills to use those technologies being deployed appropriately in all manufacturing firms? And I know, Chris, you and I have talked about this, this issue of, and we have colleagues in both our organizations working on this, how do we support smaller organizations to adopt technologies that already exist? But then at the other end, there's the ecosystem's problem of what about the emerging technologies, the ones that are what on earth is going to be happening on the quantum side of things? If we're going to be developing a strong quantum technology sector and quantum computing, well, how do we think about the manufacturing skills for that? There's so much more to be developed before we get to anything re um, resembling high volume manufacturing. So just as a, I guess my quick answer would be those two extremes, the ecosystem is, is reacting pretty well. But I think there's a, a lot to be done at that difference between the skills for generating new manufacturing knowledge before we start making things, the skills for diffusing that knowledge to make sure that companies know about it. So the development of standards of characterization of these new processes. And then there's the skills required for deploying that technology throughout manufacturing. And I guess it's sometimes those, those things get a wee bit muddled up, but it is an effort needed in all of those three areas. Now, and perhaps we'll come back to this later because I know the work of the, the catapult in ensuring that as we develop technologies, we're also in parallel developing the skills so we don't end up in a strange place where we've got this great technology achievement, but no people to actually use it uh, at scale in manufacturing. So I guess the, the, the summary answer would be, I think the, the innovation, the ecosystem in the UK is responding to these different areas but the, it's not fully joined up yet. And so the areas where we're developing the new technologies and we're deploying the existing ones, perhaps almost regarded as separate worlds, where it actually, it's part of the same manufacturing skills journey. I'll, Thank I'll you, Tim. I think that, that the breadth, the integration is fundamentally important. I think one area might be of in, really, real importance to explore, and I think Rory's touched on this. Rory Ingram has is, is posted a question, but it's about... Um, that wider, well, what is manufacturing in this modern world? What what What's the start and the end, as it were? And I think we'll come to this more nebulous type situation where it's not just producing something in, within a factory boundary, as it were, it becomes more of a cradle to grave type approach. So that, that invokes what types of skill sets do we need to span that complete spectrum and, and who would be important in terms of coming in to help support that? So you can you try and understand how materials are extracted from the ground all the way through to end of life. Of the product or the service you're ultimately offering and what skills does that invoke in terms of a broader manufacturing context so i think there's probably a lot to explore on the evolution of this and how more of a modern approach as it were to terms of product evolution product development would, would elicit you know kind of this wider skill set that's required and a knowledge base that's required to actually do this it sounds like it's getting very complicated but you know there should be substantive opportunity on the back of that to, to do something quite unique for the uk if we can harness that kind of proposition. Gwen, Jennifer, would you like to come in and add anything further to that particular question? Um, there is one question in the chat that was asking uh, um, Rory uh, Ingram, yeah, about the, I don't know if it's the same question that you mentioned, but maybe it's another one, like on the first part of the presentation, 
Um, so he's asking whether there is in fact too much focus on the manufacturer. And uh, I mean, we can uh, open up. I just want to give a first, uh, I think a first immediate reaction is that um, mm. We don't think there is an, there is too much focus, and the reason is that actually there are a lot of complementarities between the design phase and the manufacturing phase. And the U.S. after the global financial crisis sort of went back reverse, and the the ARA program and programs that follow actually refocus quite a lot on the advanced manufacturing. You know, if you remember in the Harvard Business Review, there was the famous article where. Um, a bunch of economists recognize that actually the industrial commons have been lost. And I think there is, um, I mean, at least in this panel, we kind of agree on the fact that there are uh, certain types of complementarities between the two phases that we cannot, you cannot, we, we cannot really free ride, uh, as someone told the, in a previous uh, conversation, free ride on the design or on the, on the innovation and just do the manufacturing or the other way around. Uh, so I think the two are really interrelated and the the better results, if we can say better that the U.S. are seeing now are actually the results are a 15 years focus on the advanced manufacturing sectors. Thank you, Gwen. Yeah, just, just picking up further on Rory's point, I think it's really important to consider, as I said, the, the breadth of what you're trying to achieve here and, and what, what's the ultimate impact and outcome you're trying to achieve as well and how does that influence and shape the manufacturing aspect of what you're doing? So Rory's Rory, I think you're talking to perhaps co uh, controversial. Is there too much focus on manufacturing? Uh, design enables manufacturing and manufacture enables design, but design comes first. Interesting, Rory, uh, positioning. Did the, did the USA's focus on product development highlighted in the earlier slides yield any better results than other countries with more focus on manufacturing? Excellent question. Gwen uh, or Jennifer, would you like to come in and comment on the, the product focus angle of the US and if that's generated any um, better results, as Rory calls it? Yeah, I think I, I don't have much to add to what uh, Wayne already mentioned, but perhaps uh, just saying like, in particular in, in the US, but also we saw in Switzerland, that they emphasize how manufacturing capabilities actual, allow, actually allows that design to actually become alive or like, again, again with research. You can have very good research capabilities, but if you don't have manufacturing capabilities, it's really difficult to commercialize or or to convert those capabilities into actually profits. So I think again, is is the same point that when main made both are are related. So you need both to be able to to actually um, yeah commercialize any any innovation. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Okay, should we move on? Uh, Gwen, I've got a, a question for yourself, particularly around the German context, I guess. What, why is the perception of manufacturing poorer, I guess, in the UK than it is in other countries such as Germany? So uh, what, what goes on in Germany to say, this is great, you've got the US maybe in the middle, gone, this is crude, and then you've got the UK on the extreme of, this isn't it's perceived to be as an attractive proposition, as it were, for uh, particularly our younger generation. So, so what, what's going on in Germany then we could all learn from? Uh, well, um, just a few ideas, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure about the fact that there is a, definitely a policy element. So in countries like Germany or uh, also the, if Italy still where I'm from, the second manufacturing country in Europe, I think uh, there's there was never the rhetoric that uh, the country could live on services or there was always the idea that the, the most developed parts of the countries are the most industrialized part of the countries. Well, I think like in the UK, it has been uh, quite different. Uh, so I think there is a policy element that, that matter. I um, don't know how much we want to enter into that, but definitely there is a rhetoric and a narrative that um, goes across generation. And I think also there is uh, the other bit of the story, which is the, the business actors and the um, in in which sectors are the, the biggest company in, Ger in Germany active. And it's, it's true that there are the Siemens type of company, but also the, a sector that I study a bit more, the automotive sector, just to give you a couple of number of uh, the one of the biggest actors, Volkswagen. Um, Volkswagen spent 19 billion in research and development. This was the date, the figure from 2022, and it employs around 300,000 people only in Germany. So I think the fact that there are these big uh, big companies with that organize and manage complex 
supply chain, but they are the orchestrator, let's say, and they are quite recognized in the country that these are companies that can provide good and stable job is uh, is quite important. So I would say that there is a policy and a business element that in especially in a country like Germany are different uh, and stronger than 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 the UK. Thank you, Gwen. Do, do I dare mention industrial strategy at this point, or is Tim going to eject me from the the rooms? Of it? Um, it, is this something that's are you aware? And I've got it's an open question. Maybe the audience can help me out with this one as well. But do, in these in US, Singapore, Germany, what's their positioning regarding industrial strategy and the longevity about what they're focusing on? You know, have, have they got that? And does that and does that help the perception of manufacturing being something a bit more stable and, and important to the overall health and well-being of their society? Would anyone like to comment? I, I, we don't have to answer. We can, we can throw it back to the audience or we can come back at a later point. But I just thought that, that might be an interesting angle on, sure. you know, to help the perceptions of a nation, as it were. If, if their governments are actually focusing on this, they've got a big, you know, strategic imperative around this. It's important to their economy. Therefore, it gives the confidence to the people working within that economy that this, this is something to get involved with. If I can just chip in, I thought there's absolutely a, a, a virtuous cycle of that by having it maybe, and I don't know where the starting point is, but by having a slightly more positive perception of what manufacturing is, it is more likely to be taken seriously, which will mean it'll appear in strategy documents that will drive forward activities in it, which will then en enhance perceptions of it. But again, that's just my outside view. Gwen, Jennifer, you've been reviewing the documents. What would be your thoughts on that? Um, I, I just have a quick, quick thought on Germany. I think Germany is an interesting case because the, uh, the documents that you find, we're also doing another work now with Jennifer about this, and German documents, most of them, especially those like at the national level, not at the land level, at the, at the regional one, but they actually uh, tend to refer to the fact that they don't do industrial strategies. They don't do industrial policy. Uh, they don't select some sectors over other. But if you then look at how funding is allocated in terms of uh, providing uh, easier access to finance or the R&D or the um, measures to adopt new technologies to small and medium enterprises, uh, the uh, equivalent, but like 10, 20 times more of what is made smarter here of the Fraunhofer catapults that you can catapults, sorry, the Fraunhofer network. Um, what are the catapults here? You actually can see that they are picking sectors, uh, at least parts of the manufacturing sector. So on Germany, I think it's very interesting, the narrative that they have and then the reality on the ground. Thank you very much, Gwen. Okay, we've got a time for a few more questions before we come to the end of the session. I think we could go on for quite a few hours actually talking about this topic. I think there's so much to, to, um, to, to discuss. I think there's just a general one coming in about policy positions. So. I'll just open it up to the, the panel in general, but uh, so on the Q&A, do common perceptions majorly influence the policy positions of states when it comes to research and innovation and trade? How do market-driven economies leverage their complementary strengths when it comes to future-proofing globalised manufacturing? There's a lot contained within that. Would anyone like to offer some sort of response to that question? Um, yeah, perhaps I... Yeah, I can comment on that. I think, I mean, it, obviously it's, it's related with the, with the previous question. And I think policy shapes perceptions, but obviously public perception also shape how policy is framed. And I think, I mean, we saw like over 20 years of, uh, yeah, during a time where industrial policy was not well perceived and it started from the government, but obviously that expanded to, to the public. And I think going, reverting that trend is not that easy. Uh, and and that's I think that's why in, in countries even like Germany, in the narrative, in their strategies, they present like a very uh, liberal approach and like non-interventionist, uh, but in practice is it's a bit different. Uh, so I think, and and we can see that in in other cases as well. For example, even in not in the countries that we analyze, but for example in Chile, it's it's very similar. They have been through like many decades where talking about industrial policy was not accepted, and now they are doing industrial policy, but they are not talking about industrial policy. So sometimes it's 
do as I say, and sometimes it's do as I do. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Just a general question about policy. Is there any good examples of how agile policy making can be approached? I'm just you just appreciate what, what we're faced with, particularly the transition towards a net zero society. And there's a lot of moving pieces around that and a lot of information coming in and, and various strategies. Is there any good is there any insights from the international context or maybe the UK context about how policy has been developed in that space, but how it's been developed in an agile manner to reflect what's going on, you know, kind of in those those kind of broader trends? I can uh, quick comment on that, if I may. And um, I, I guess one of the nice examples is uh, vehicle propulsion systems and electrification, where you know it has it has been moving at a pace and accelerating for all sorts of global reasons at perhaps a greater speed than had been anticipated. But the ability, again, just using a UK example of the um, electrification skills framework and the Faraday and all of these activities that say the world has changed very quickly. We must react to that. We can't wait too long to do that. Let's move in and do things very quickly and make sure we've got in place the not only the, the technology, the industrial uh, industrialization capability, including the, a framework for skills. And that seemed to happen in a very, as you say, Chris, a very agile, a very rapid way, rather than taking an awful long time to think about it and then go, well, the world's moved on by the time we get there. This is perhaps contrasted with other sectors where things are perhaps less agile and maybe Again, in the UK context, we, we might be falling behind slightly. But I think there are examples, as you say, where this has worked and can work remarkably well. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Maybe we could explore those at our next event in April. Maybe we should park that one for now because I'm just conscious of time. Thank you very much, Tim. Time for one more brief question. Jennifer, I'd just like to, to come back to yourself. Why are there less women than men in manufacturing? Yeah. Simple to yeah. ask, probably very challenging to respond against this one, but it'd be really important. And are there any specific examples of initiatives to promote women in manufacturing? Could you share those? That's come from Carla, Carlos Lopez Gomez. Sure. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean obviously it's a, a complex issue and this is not really like uh, deterministic. There have been, uh, yeah, times where there were more women in manufacturing and again, even Nowadays, in developing countries, you will see more participation of women in manufacturing. But a lot has to do with gender norms and, and stereotypes. Uh, in general, manufacturing has been framed as a male space, and that discourages women to participate in this sector. But also, it has, is again, as we saw, is is a perception. But sometimes this perception is confirmed. And many women have found that uh, manufacturing spaces sometimes are not that inclusive. Uh, this has been changing and we have seen many or, or increasing examples of how they are uh, working on providing flexible working, for example, flexible arrangements. Uh, but sometimes there is struggle also to find examples of how to do this in the manufacturing uh, context. But I think, yeah, it's, it's related with gender norms, which are very difficult to, to change. But I think what is easier to change is to change uh, like how these uh, environments can be more inclusive. And it's not only for women, it's also for men to participate also in care responsibilities. And obviously uh, also for uh, people that don't uh, identify with uh, any of these binary genders. So it's in general about, about making these spaces more inclusive. And in terms of, of initiatives, uh, I mentioned this example about uh, from the US where they are trying to recognize women uh, and one thing that we usually hear is that uh, whenever there are not women in events is because they don't know any women in that area or no women were available. But sometimes there are many women there, but they are not part of the network. So about yeah, increasing the visibility of these women is quite important. And mentoring is, is as well quite important. Uh, so I think like two very straightforward initiatives are like recognizing giving visibility to role models, but also providing opportunities for mentoring and, and networking. Thank you very much, Jennifer. There's some actually amazing points. There's some really important points that have been raised specifically then and, of course, throughout the, the discussion here in your presentations. I've got a few minutes left, and I think I'm between everyone and a weekend, so that's probably the worst place to be in in terms of trying to wrap up this really quickly. But 
I'd, firstly and foremost, I'd like to thank everyone involved today for supporting this, this session. Very important, extremely important topic, particularly our speakers, uh, Jennifer, Gwen and Tim as well, being part of the Q&A, so thank you very much. Also, I'd just like to do a brief wrap-up uh, of what we've done today, but also inform you of an up-and-coming event in the near, very near future in Sheffield. So without further ado, I'd just like to give a quick overview of the session today. So we've explored several important concepts, particularly around the importance of manufacturing to the UK economy, explored the policy piece, particularly how it needs to respond to the, the emerging trends or the, the trends that are out actually upon us, particularly around the net zero transition, the broader industrial sustainability piece, and obviously the digitalization, it's absolutely fundamental here to enable the, these kind of in, the new worlds going forward. So we explored that, that kind of bigger piece around the importance to the manufacturing to the UK economy, economy plus also addressing social challenges on this green and digital transition. I think that the big angle around image, perception, I've got something around my mind uh, going back to, uh, you mentioned everything, every, what is it? everything, everywhere, all at once, a film reference. I'd also probably like to reference back to Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. I can see someone whizzing around a mechanical loom, as it were, and I think there's an important point there about perceptions and the new world we're about to enter or we're entering, particularly with the green and digital transition. What will that do to this work environment going forward? And what, what are the bigger societal challenges we need to, we're going to be faced with in transitioning to that new state? So the, that perception piece is absolutely fundamental. Obviously linked into that is that attractiveness to this sector, particularly how does this support uh, underrepresented communities, which, which are very eloquently highlighted by the presentation today about this gender um, challenge that we do face and what potential interventions we can put in place to help support that. The international context is fundamental to try and understand what's going on in that particular space and bring in best practice, particularly from um, other more industrialized nations that focus on manufacturing as a word, Germany, USA, Singapore, seem like a really good um, environment to explore. So hopefully that's done some justice to that, but there is, there is a, a very detailed full report that you can download subsequently, and we'll give you the QR, QR code very, very shortly. Uh, just in the last few minutes, that I, yeah, thank you very much. There's the QR code highlighted, and we'll, we'll, we'll issue that after the presentation. And so just to wrap up then, we have a, an exciting conference coming up. It's classed as the Future of UK Manufacturing on the 16th and 17th of April at Cutlers Hall, Sheffield. This is a co-hosted event with uh, by the UK Manufacturing Forum, for, um, Forum in partnership with, e, with EPSRC. Of course, um, myself and Tim will be uh, heavily supporting this session, so you can't get, can't get uh, away from us too quickly, as it were. From that point of view, we'll be back in a few months' time. But just give you an overview of what we're trying to achieve there. It's really focusing on the, the importance of manufacturing. It's become more vital than ever that it uh, it shows our long-term international competitiveness in the UK. There's some big transitions of particularly, as I mentioned, industrial sustainability, transition to net zero, the resilience piece is absolutely fundamental. How all this couples together, then you've got the digital transition piece <laughs> wrapped around it all is a very complex ecosystem. So during this session, we're going to have several um, keynote speakers, as it were, focused on many aspects of exploring the academic uh, RTO, Research Technology Organisation, Landscape and Industry, and how all this connects together, working in partnership with the, particularly the funding environment of EPSRC and Innovate UK and other supporters in that particular space. As you can see on the slide here, we have several leading figures from government, academia and innovation agencies and industry, of course, to support this session. So we've got uh, Kedar, Sarah, Proa and Catherine Bennett representing EPSRC, UKMF, in this instance with Sarah Sharples, Crowe is going to talk about the um, University of Sheffield Advanced Manufacturing Research uh, Centre journey, as it were, and the transformation of the Orgreave site in Sheffield, the Rotherham region, which is absolutely amazing story and a lot of lessons learned in that particular space. And of course, we have Catherine Bennett as well, who's the chief chief executive officer of the High Valley Manufacturing Catapult, giving us an overview of the, how Catapult is involved and help being supportive in this particular context. So what we're going to do very briefly is review the current successes, opportunities and challenges for UK manufacturing in the short, medium, long term. We're going to understand how we integrate and connect the roles of manufacturing, research, innovation, ecosystems with the manufacturing community and how we need to evolve this going forward. That leads into the design approach for the, the session, which is very much uh, a whole series of interactions as we're over the two days, particularly workshops on the second day to understand 
how we can develop this network further and how we can support initiatives in this space. So it should be a really lively, interactive, insightful session coming up on the 16th or 17th of April. If you're interested, um, just on the last item there, there's a, um, a web address. No, there's an email address rather at IFM. You, you can you can hook into, as it were. So it's there on the bottom left of the slide. So please contact that, that inbox, as it were, and um, uh, email address rather, and we can uh, obviously get you registered for the event. So that's coming up very shortly in Cutlass Hall, Sheffield. So it'd be a pleasure to see you all there. And so just one final note, I think I've, I've just gone over time, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone involved, particularly the audience. Thank you very much for your participation and the questions raised. Thank you very much for everyone who arranged in this session today and the speakers. Um, unless there's anything else, I wish you all a great weekend and hope to see you all in Cutler's Hall on the 16th and 17th of April. Thank you very much. <laughs>